tonight is all about the launch of our new policy proposal uh, in many respects called The Route to Tomorrow's Journeys. As an industry, we rebranded recently uh, to this new logo, uh, which doesn't depict a stereotypical motorcycle. It's all about forward vision and looking into the future. And our new, logo, our new slogan, sorry, is today's industry, tomorrow's journeys. So it's really to demonstrate that as an industry, we're here to be able to provide and support the strategy that the government's launched for tomorrow. In the government strategy document, those of you that have taken the time to read it will realize that there were some big statements in there. This being one of them, need to think differently about the car. Active and healthy travel, create more urban living space, vision zero, which is all about road safety, zero carbon, recently announced by 2050. I think this all adds up, uh, as it's already been said, as into a transport revolution. If we look at uh, Bayes' own figures, in 2017, you can see a fairly high percentage there of CO2 emissions created by transport, which excludes aviation. So that's all road-based transport. And you can see now by 2050, moved up from 80% to now zero uh, is the new target. So I would describe this as a massive challenge. And to achieve those objectives, there's got to be some big decisions. And recently, I met with the new Minister for Transport, uh, Michael Ellis, and Michael uh, said to me that, uh, what is it you want from us then, Tony, after I'd sold him the idea of what we were saying? And I said, I'm going to fire you a question back. Tell me what it is you want to achieve. If you're serious about achieving your future of urban mobility strategy, you've got to make some big decisions and there is no one fixed solution, but I believe we're part of the jigsaw. So it's not going to be easy, because I guess if you could start again, in other words, completely flatten London and redesign a new city, it would be easy. But the mature markets, I refer to them, so the markets that are developed, historic cities that were designed from a bygone era, even previous to the motor vehicle, and of course, those cities have had to adapt to uh, accept that change. But of course, in many respects, we've gone way too far. And motor vehicles started to really dominate the space in city living. But of course, we have to be very mindful of this. We have to avoid damage to business. We have to make sure that cities don't lose the appeal for future investment. Healthy streets must also be financially healthy. Otherwise, a city won't survive. And of course, one of my big things is respecting people's freedom. We live in a democracy. We live in a space where we can often make most of the decisions we like, and people want choice. It's in our human nature. And of course, modal shift to any of this will be critical to success. I make this statement, the market is already deciding. I'm sure if you do spend time in London, you're starting to see a growing number of these e-micro scooters, mono wheels, electric skateboards. That is not a landscape that I'm sure that we really want to see because of the uh, road safety challenges. And all that will do is it will take people away from healthy streets and into something completely different. So the market is already making decisions. In fact, in France and Germany, they've deregulated to allow these vehicles to be used on the highway. And we're already seeing a number of road deaths in very, very early days since this has been adopted. So this is not a space that we would necessarily want to encourage, but we have to also listen to the way the customer's thinking. So, I've already run through those, so it's really how and what, and this is where I think as an industry we fit in. So, this is one of our strap lines that's inside the document, is the right vehicle for the right journey. You know, why would you own a car? So the need to own a car is becoming occasional use. In fact, I saw a DFT figure the other day that told me that 96% of the time a car is not being used by the average family. So you own a car for 4% use. Complete madness. So we can already see that there's some trends and changes and people are now starting to look at car share schemes and they're starting to look at part ownership. In fact, some of the large automotives are launching programs to not actually own a vehicle, but you know, pay a fee and use a vehicle when you want. But that doesn't necessarily present the complete solution. Putting an electric engine into a normal car is not gonna deal with some of the challenges. 
Vans are often unladen, but old habits die hard. How many vans do we see around there that are unladen? You know, the telecom van of the past was racked out with lots of connections and wires and stuff. Now the guy carries around a laptop, but he still drives a van. Online convenience shopping has forced change. I'm sure we're all familiar with uh, Just Eat, Amazon Prime and everything else. It's created a revolution in how we're trying to move these, move these goods. So for me, it's time that we discover the right vehicle for the right journey. Cars, vans, bikes, and everything in between. The evolution of our roads in the last 50 years has been dramatic but not compared with the changes we must embrace in the next decade. The need to reduce congestion, to improve air quality, put us on the brink of immeasurable change, a transport revolution. Single occupancy cars and lightly laden vans will be driven out in favor of more energy efficient, less road hungry vehicles. Walking, using public transport and cycling will rightly be promoted as the greener options but they won't fulfill every transport scenario. Choosing the right vehicle for the right journey is where powered light vehicles come in. PLVs are practical, efficient and safe. Just a 10% modal shift from private cars to PLVs would result in a 12% reduction in journey time delay for everyone, according to our study. Their smaller size and weight means that with the same 10% modal shift, emissions of NOx and particulate matter fall significantly. Electrification of PLVs offers further benefits, with zero emissions and better energy efficiency than larger vehicles. They have a significant role to play in the first mile and every urban mile, as well as last mile deliveries. But creating a safe environment for them as we move towards the long-term objective of achieving zero casualties on our roads, remains a priority. As we adapt to a new transport future, where choosing the right vehicle for the right journey is key, the role PLVs have to play in local and national transport policy must not be overlooked. Okay, so touched on most of the subjects, so I'm not going to run through them in great detail, but we've referred to the study in the video. We've done a whole piece of research and the impact. These figures on particulate matter 10 and particulate matter 2.5, I'm not an expert, but I'm told by the experts that these figures are pretty impressive with a fairly low level of uh, modal shift from other vehicle types. I think this particular argument is really misunderstood because... If we want to create a nicer place in inner city environments and we want to open space up, to do that, that means you have to reduce road space. If you reduce road space, you create more congestion. So you need to get more efficiency out of that space. And a big part of our study was about how can these lighter, smaller vehicles be less road space hungry. And I know there's a whole myriad of other benefits that come with that in terms of road surface, wear and tear on roads. Uh, and also the environmental efficiency. And I'm not going to go into that detail because I've got an expert here that might refer to that. Um, but there are many, many benefits. If we then look at journey time delays, uh, there was a big traffic jam out there earlier on and I nearly took a picture of it and I was going to put it on the screen for tonight, but I'm sure we're all familiar with it. And then, of course, if we then think about delivery and delay, uh, delays to deliveries and reduction times, the logistics guys would love us. So this particular argument around efficient use of road space, I don't think it's actually particularly well mentioned in the government strategy, but it mustn't be underestimated because this is going to be key to the success. I spoke about healthy streets. Uh, I refer to these as cappuccino corners. Uh, I know Highbury Corner in North London, part of my old stomping ground when I was a kid, uh, is now going to be a quarter of the roundabout that it was. It's single lane traffic going in both directions. Um, and the Bloody noisy motorbikes, you can't beat them, can you? Um, and uh, it had to happen. Um, and, uh, and that whole space there is being opened up into inner city green space. So and looking at these vehicle types will allow local authorities, city authorities, national government to free a lot of this space up. So what about moving people to work and study? Um, one of my... I like to refer to Pauline, I've not seen her here yet tonight. Pauline Reeves at the DFT, my best friend. 
uh, and Pauline's head of road safety at the DFT. And um, when we first met, she was pretty hostile towards me, but now I think, you know, there's a close relationship there with Pauline. And Pauline said to me, when we started to present the ideas and the themes and the subjects that we were going to talk around, she suddenly switched her attention to say, actually, what you're saying really fits in with where government are moving, particularly around moving young people into work and study. The government, obviously, it's been the thing to do over the last 10 or 15, 20 years to go to university. Now we've got a trade shortage and we've got to start putting people back through apprenticeships. But how are we going to move these people into the workplace? And clearly, these types of vehicles, particularly the L1 vehicles, are the obvious solution to do that. What about this last mile? Um, you know, I think we, again, can get slightly misled with last mile deliveries. There's a last mile everywhere. We could look at that map, and everywhere on that map represents a last mile. And therefore, it's impossible to have a spider's web of logistics distribution centers and one of the really big challenges. So we need to look at vehicle types that can move those goods in that urban space in a really efficient way. Of course, let's not forget about road safety. As an industry, as a user group, we have a horrendous road safety issue, which is why I've got my best friends from PACT, Ross here, all of the people that help us and support us with road safety. But we're embracing that challenge around road safety. Uh, and within our initiative is some programs which are going to start to really target some of these road safety challenges. But we can't do that alone. Depends on which way you want to look at STATS 19. Not everybody knows what STATS 19 is. I'm not an expert around it. But what I do know is the primary causation of accidents involving traditionally powered two-wheelers is 40% at the fault of the rider and 60% of other reasons, infrastructure, other road users. If this is a sector of the market that's part of the solution, like bicycles, we need to take another view of road safety. Otherwise, it will be the reason not to do it rather than the reason to encourage it. And as with cycling, we wanted to encourage cycling, right thing to do, so how do we make it safe? It's just one of the challenges. It's not a reason not to do it. Education and training, I've touched on that already, but this is a particularly interesting initiative because as an industry, we've got to accept that some of our riders don't ride well. We're doing a, a, an activity tomorrow with the City of London, uh, trying to improve rider behaviours and uh, speeding in the city. Um, but for sure, as an industry, we need to say, OK, look, how can we make and encourage our riders to become better riders? How can we get them to become better road users? And how can we reward them to do that? And that's the challenge which we're going to take on as an industry. But what we need is that other 60% for a more holistic approach around road safety and how we can revisit that, because the same old methods are not working anymore. Let's scare them. Let's show somebody bent over the front of the car with a leg hanging off. That will deal with the road safety issues, and we know that doesn't work. We need to look at this in a different way. So I spoke about micro-mobility, you know, and uh, Philip from the Bicycle Association is with us this evening. You know, e-bikes and the whole challenge of e-bikes and high-powered e-bikes is a threat. It's a threat to cycling, and it's a threat to our world. Micro-mobility is also a threat. There is regulation that exists in this sector, which means the products are safe, they're well built, they're regulated, they're licensed, and there's training. There's some areas across the L category spectrum, one to seven, which probably need to have a look at. But rather than say, oh, that's an easy opportunity, we're working with the DVSA to make sure that they understand where these risks are and we can then support them to put in place access points that would make these vehicles much safer. Connected vehicles, clearly a big part of the future, and there's a working group at European level at the moment that's working on connectivity. And I saw some really interesting concepts. I was speaking in Canada a few weeks ago, and there's a company over there that's de developed some technology, which is uh, amazing. Uh, JLR funded a project with, uh, with Arc Motorcycles, a new brand that's got some fantastic safety technology that they're uh, building into their bikes, and it is about connectivity with other vehicles. So. Industry is ready. We've got global manufacturers, UK SMEs, products already on the market. R&D for sure is in progress. Legislation and regulation is in place, and I think this is really key. End users, they're regulated, they're insured, they're licensed, and they're trained. An obvious solution, 
we have heard enough for me, so I think you should hear now from Andy Eastlake from Low CVP because he believes so.